All right, guys, it may be a little bit hard to see. I'm going to quickly review what's coming up on uh, your next quiz here for you guys. And what we have at this point is President Lincoln has been elected. He has won election, and he is headed into Washington. But we know he didn't win. He only has 40% of, of the vote. Down here in these blue states, the southern states, he's not even on the ballot. Um, but we have a few more states who have not yet seceded. And as time goes on, that is going to happen. The vice president of the Confederacy is a young man named Alexander, well, he's not young, he's Alexander Stevens. He happens to be Lincoln's best friend, and he secretly hopes that the uh, Confederacy is going to fail. He's chosen specifically because if he's got to negotiate with President Lincoln, who better to negotiate with than your best friend? The president of the Confederacy is Jefferson Davis. He is elected president while he is not in the nominating convention in Montgomery, Alabama. He is at home sick um, with malaria, and when he finds out he was recovering from his bout with malaria. His wife said he looked like all color from his face drain, like he just heard that a loved one um, had died. And that focuses the action on Fort Sumter. Um, commanding Fort Sumter is this guy, Major Robert Anderson, who is in charge of the beleaguered garrison, who on Christmas night moved, or Christmas Eve night, moved out and into the fort with his 68 men, low on supplies, figuring that no one could get them there. Outgoing President James Buchanan tries to send them food in the civilian ship Star of the West. When it gets fired upon, it turns around and heads home. Jefferson Davis sends Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard to force the Union soldiers out of the fort. At West Point, PGT Beauregard was Robert Anderson's best student. And they're, you know, talking, negotiating, when Robert Anderson says, well, you give me the deadline till 4 o'clock this morning or so. If you wait a couple more days, we're going to run out of food and I'm going to leave. Upon hearing that, crazy Virginian secessionist Edmund Ruffin fires the first shot that opens the bombardment on Fort Sumter, which we know is this giant home plate looking structure, two stories above the water, eight to 12 foot thick walls. After 33 hours of constant shelling, it is reduced to rubble, and Robert Anderson takes down the flag. He's given a 50 gun salute, one of the guns backfires, killing the soldier shooting it. And what's sad and pathetic about that is the first casualty of the Civil War um, is a gun that backfired. And so now Lincoln is faced with this problem. What do we do? And he calls for 75,000 troops to go down and suppress this rebellion. The Confederacy did fire first. Now, what are we going to do about it? Lincoln needs to get those soldiers to Washington rapidly because he is almost surrounded by the Confederates. Just over the river is enemy territory, and Maryland is on the bubble. And so Lincoln has got to choose carefully. You go from Maryland to Western Virginia to Kentucky to Missouri are these four states that could swing either way. And Lincoln has to decide what to leave alone, what to stay hands off, what to meddle in indirectly, and what to directly intervene. And in Baltimore, after his soldiers are fired upon by a riot of plug uglies, Lincoln decides that he is going to directly intervene. While he's doing so, he's trying to get his army whipped into shape. German drill instructors are brought in to try and get these guys who think this is going to be fun. 90-day enlistments, we get to get off the farm or out of the factory for a few days, and it's all hijinks. 
until they get to Washington, and all of a sudden they got guys screaming and yelling at them, hay foot, straw foot, marching like we did out on the softball field the other day. This is no longer any fun. To stop the war, General Winfield Scott, who is too old to lead troops in combat, comes up with the Anaconda Plan. A plan to blockade all southern ports, take over the port of New Orleans and the Mississippi River, squeeze the Confederacy like an anaconda, and then attack the capital of Richmond. Asked to take over all Union forces is Colonel Robert E. Lee, who after listening to the president and sitting up into the wee hours of the night, decides to turn the job down to stay with his home state of Virginia. This was way before that we thought of ourselves as American. The country was still pretty young. And so you thought of your home state or your home county as your country rather than the nation as a whole. And so General Irvin McDowell is given charge of the Union forces. And he was a guy who had no political skill or charm. It said the only battle he had ever won um, was with the watermelon because he ate a lot. And he had never led an army in combat before. So he's putting the men through their training paces. And representatives and senators would come over and interrupt. Well, that's not how you do that, gentlemen. This is what you should be doing. And they totally contradict what the general had just said. And since he never stops them, or never says, excuse me, Senator, can you please step away? He loses credibility with the men. He was also not confident enough to try and get good subordinates, so he tried to micromanage everything. And the example I use, some people are good at small tasks. They can lead a certain number of people doing a certain thing, but when they get promoted, they can't take over the entire job. So some assistant principals don't make good principles, right? It's like on an athletic team, an assistant coach for the offense is great, but when he or she takes over and becomes the head coach, the job, the logistics, the planning, the money, the uniforms, the travel is too much for them. And Irvin McDowell simply can't handle it. Under pressure from Congress and for President Lincoln staring at him, he decides to go on to Richmond, where he leads his men <clears throat> out of the city. They're headed to Richmond, 120 miles away, and they have this jerking stop-and-go quality, because when Irvin McDowell's out front, they move. When he goes back to check on something, they stop. There's no intelligence. They don't have a map. They're stopped in Centerville for a couple days by logs painted black like cannons. So they're like a bubbling group of oaks, plus the men really don't have discipline yet. And Irvin McDowell said, we got to go straight at them because I can get my army to go forward, but the intricate battle maneuvers, right wheel, left wheel, attack, retreat, they simply couldn't do it. Traveling along with the soldiers are a group of reporters and senators and congressmen who printed out victory tickets. The victory ball will be held in the governor's mansion in Richmond as soon as we win. This was going to be a spectator sport. They were going to go check it out. And when the battle finally begins in the early morning, uh, which usually billed as a massive Union defeat simply isn't true. Urban McDowell threw a fake jab going over across Cub Run Bridge, and he leads most of his troops in a big right hook coming across um, Bull Run Creek. It's July 21st. The guys have got to get moving because those 90-day enlistments are already up. And early in the morning, Jackson is doing incredibly er McDowell's troops are winning. They're shoving into and they're pushing back the forces of PGT Beauregard. Beauregard had dug in on a hill. He got veterans of Northern Virginia residents to show him some, some good terrain. And his men, while they're dug in, they start to get pushed back because they're being assaulted from both sides. 
When onto the scene, getting off a train arrives, the X Factor on, in Bull Run, um, General Thomas Jackson, this strange odd duck who had many idiosyncrasies. He held his left hand aloft to keep his blood flowing. He ate lemons. Pepper made his left leg hurt. He would open his eyes and slosh them around in a bucket of cold water every morning. He just did weird stuff. But he shows up and he's watching this whole thing with his group and getting driven back is General Bernard B. of the 4th Alabama and his men are getting crushed. He turns them and says, there sits Jackson like a darn stone wall. Let us determine to die here and we are going to conquer. And it's probably not a compliment, it is an insult, but Jackson's fame is about to be made. General B gets killed very shortly thereafter. Also killed at first on um, Bull Run is former Congressman Edward Baker, who said we must conquer a peace and dictate the terms, whether it takes 7,000 or 700,000 lives. So he gets shot very early on in Bull Run as well. And when Jackson sends his troops in screaming, the, the, the rebel yell, McDowell's troops freeze. They were attacking um, Beauregard, and as they start moving forward, Jackson's men attacks along with Jeb Stewart, and McDowell's men make the worst mistake possible. They stop. They don't keep going to force the action. Um, they stop, and now they can be attacked from two directions. And here is where the trouble begins. They begin to retreat. Not because they were beaten. And the truth is, a lot of heat is put on the soldiers of First Manassas Bull Run. And that, to me, is incorrect. These were holiday soldiers. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know what to expect, the shock and the noise and the screaming and the yelling. But they do it, and they, they do it well, better than anybody had the right to expect. The men could go forward, but they could not retreat. And as they get near Bull Run Creek, and the Confederate cannons are, are, are falling shortly um, behind them, the congressmen panic, there's just a total traffic jam on Bull Run Creek, and it's chaos. And the Union Army, who almost had the battle won, and the war would be over, they simply go home, and Irvin McDowell is fired. Lincoln has got to deal with the loss of the first battle. While he's doing that, here's where he directly intervenes in Maryland, where he has his first constitutional crisis, where he revokes the writ of habeas corpus on all rail lines between Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia, targeting Baltimore. And he sent his general, Benjamin Butler, to arrest a series of um, pro-secessionist legislators in Baltimore, including John Merriman. John Merriman is arrested and not charged when his uncle, United States Supreme Court Justice Roger Taney, finds out, and he issues a writ of habeas corpus. And when... One, a reason for the arrest of Merriman is not issued. Tawney calls for a joint meeting of Congress and wants Lincoln, Lincoln impeached. President Lincoln responds by saying, I've been a little bit of lawyer in myself, and as I read the Constitution, there are three reasons when habeas corpus can be revoked. The threat of invasion, rebellion, or when public safety dictates. So, a mile from here is Confederate territory, all right? Um, threat of public safety, there was um, a, uh, my troops were beaten up in Baltimore. There's public safety rebellion. There's secessionists getting ready to march out by St. Louis and capture our, our arsenal. Invasion, there are enemy troops a mile away. So I argue that not only one factor of the writ of habeas corpus has been met to revoke it, but I argue all three. Furthermore, the Constitution doesn't say which branch can remove it, so I say all three can. And Lincoln wins his first constitutional crisis 
as Tawney just goes away. Now, Lincoln will be criticized several more times for being a tyrant and a dictator for revoking habeas corpus. But in his mind, it's something he had to do. He didn't have a choice. Um, this will lead us to the famous battle of the ironclads, the Monitor and the Merrimack, or the Monitor and the Virginia. The U.S. Navy sunk an older wooden vessel, the Merrimack, off of Norfolk Harbor. The Confederates will raise it and rename it the Confederate States of America, Virginia. They will tow it up the James River to Richmond, while they will coat it in armor plating, a wooden hulled vessel coated in armored plate. When the Union finds out about this, they're terrified that the Virginia is going to sail up the Potomac River and destroy Washington. So they get John Erickson to build the most revolutionary design in naval warfare history, an all-metal ship called the Monitor that had this special rotating turret with two guns on it. And the morning of the battle, early in you know, March 8th, 1862, the Virginia comes down the Dane James River and she's blocked by three U.S. Navy ships, the USS Cumberland, the Congress, and the Minnesota, and a bunch of cannons from Fort Monroe. And the captain of the Congress said, A.B. Smith said, I saw what looked like a giant barn with its roof on fire belching smoke. And everybody opens up on the Virginia, and they could see the cannonballs hit the sides and then plunk into the river. They said it was like a little kid throwing a rock or a ball at a sheet of India rubber. And so the Virginia slams into the Cumberland, sinking it. It fires on the Congress and the Minnesota, running the Congress up onto a sandbar. Wooden ships were no match for what had happened. And when night falls, the Virginia backs off, expecting to destroy the Union Navy the next day. But that night, a strange, peculiar sight sailed up the USS Monitor. And the next morning, the Confederates said it was their turn to be a surprise as they saw what looked like a tin can floating on a shingle. And the two ironclads slam away at each other for four, four and a half hours before they back off to cool their guns and vent their exhaust. The Virginia sails back up to Richmond. Both sides claim victory, but it was a draw. <coughs> the Monitor um, stays um, in active duty until on Christmas Eve it will sink just off Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. And the only other thing I forgot to put in there was the Trent Affair. When um, Mason and Slidell, James Mason and John Slidell, Confederates, will sneak, try and sneak over to London and Paris to get assistance, recognition for the Confederacy. England says that the Union has deeper pockets. It's going to win. It didn't want to choose a side. But it recognized the Confederacy's um, case as a belligerent, which means Legally, they could commit piracy on the high seas. And so it's a way for Southern cotton to get to um, the British manufacturers. The British will supply the Confederates with blockade running ships. And as Mason and Slidell were trying to get to England to ask for an official recognition, they go from Charleston, South Carolina to Havana, Cuba, where they get on board the HMS Trent. You know, a mail ship, an unarmed mail ship, headed back to England. The very next day, it is spotted by the USS San Joaquinto and Captain Wilkes, who intercepts it, illegally boards the ship, and takes Mason and Slidell a prisoner. They're taken um, up to New York, where they're in prison, and the Trent makes it back to England, and, and the captain tells Queen Victoria what happened, and she's outraged. 
The London Times said, by the Yankee breed, let Captain Wilkes be judged. And Queen Victoria is outraged. She wants to declare war on the United States and sends 8,000 soldiers to Canada to invade. William Seward, who got yelled at by Lincoln in his, you know, his first couple days in office on the worst day ever, is back and he says, great, if England attacks, it'll reunify us. And Lincoln says, look, stupid, all right, we don't want to fight a multi-front war. So Lincoln has his first international crisis as he tells the queen, look, a couple months from now and everyone forgets, I will send Mason and Slidell to you. You can tell Parliament, you stood up to me, and I can tell my government, I stood up to you. I really need this. They don't really like or trust me anyway. And that's how the Trent Affair closes. Mason and Slidell are released, but when England doesn't recognize the Confederacy, the South begins to withhold their cotton. They call it cotton diplomacy. And so England begins to cultivate cotton in Egypt and back in India where it was um, originated. Queen Victoria is also informed by her husband, Prince Albert, that he was secretly selling gunpowder, saltpeter to, to the Union and blockade runners to the Confederacy. So dear, we really don't want to declare war on them because we're making money and we don't want them to know. There's a quick review, guys. I hope you liked it. I hope you do well. Please listen to this and the podcast. I'll see you guys when I get back.